The result we're going to talk about in this video is so important to the study of polynomials and their roots that it is often called the fundamental theorem of the subject. It's not the fundamental theorem of algebra that tells us that a polynomial has roots in the complex numbers if the polynomial has rational coefficients. Instead, it's a theorem called the Galois correspondence theorem that tells us exactly what group theory has to say about field theory. In other words, what is the connection between groups of automorphisms of field extensions and the structure of those field extensions themselves? When we first talked about automorphisms, we compared them to symmetries of geometric objects. For example, here's an equilateral triangle. We can think about what is its group of symmetries. Its group of symmetries is the dihedral group of the triangle. And when we talked about that in a previous video, we made the point that every symmetry operation on this triangle will also have associated with it something called an invariant, some piece of this triangle which does not move under that symmetry operation. For instance, the center point of this equilateral triangle has associated with it some symmetries of this triangle that leave that center point in place. For example, that center point is left in place, is fixed by the identity symmetry, because the identity symmetry fixes everything, but it's also fixed by a 120 degree rotation. That leaves my center point in place. It's also fixed by a 240 degree rotation. Still leaves my center in place. So in fact, there are three different symmetries of the triangle that have this center point as their invariant. And those three symmetries form a subgroup of the dihedral group of the triangle. Specifically, that subgroup is isomorphic to Z mod 3. So what I've just done is associated to that choice of an invariant, that center point of my triangle, a subgroup, Z mod 3, of the dihedral group, the symmetry group of this triangle, that has that as an invariant. That correspondence between an invariant, a geometric invariant, and its subgroup of symmetries that leave it fixed is the heart of what we're going to do with automorphism groups. But if we choose a different invariant, we're going to get a different subgroup. For instance, if instead of the center point of my triangle, I decide to choose one of its axes of reflective symmetry, maybe this one right here, then what fixes that? Well, the identity fixes that for sure, because it fixes everything. But the other thing that fixes this line right here is the reflection that reflects across that axis of symmetry. Actually, I got that backwards. There it is. And so to that invariant, we can associate a subgroup of the group of symmetries of the triangle that has two elements in it. And that subgroup is isomorphic to Z mod 2. So the correspondence that we're setting up here is the correspondence between a subgroup of the symmetry group and the invariant that that subgroup preserves. And choosing a different invariant, point in the middle versus line of symmetry, is going to give us a different subgroup. Here, a subgroup of order 2. Here, a subgroup of order 3. That's the understanding that we want to port into our understanding of automorphisms of field extensions. And when we do that, we get the most powerful theorem in all of Galois theory, the Galois correspondence. So in the Galois correspondence, I like to say fields are groups, up is down, and everything is what it seems. Fields are groups means that what we're going to do here is associate automorphism groups and field extensions in a way that subgroups are going to exactly tell us something about subfields. And in that way, the automorphism group, the structure of the automorphism group and its subgroups, will tell us everything about the structure of the field extension and all of its subfields. But it's going to do so in a way in which up is down. In other words, if I choose a bigger subgroup, I'm going to end up with a smaller subfield that it corresponds to, precisely because we're associating to each subgroup its invariants, its fixed fields. And in order to remain fixed under a larger group, we end up having fewer elements that satisfy that property. And so the order is reversed. But when I say everything is what it seems, this is because all of our understanding about fields and groups is going to be necessary to fully grasp what's going on in the Galois correspondence. And so this is where it all comes together. Before we get started with the rest of the video, what we're going to get out of the Galois correspondence is something that anyone who's been through a course in rings and fields will remember uh, because it's very visually satisfying. So what do we get out of the Galois correspondence? We get a way of taking the group of automorphisms and if we understand all of the subgroups of that group of automorphisms, 
the Galois correspondence is going to associate to that lattice of subgroups a lattice of intermediate fields of the extension whose automorphism group that we're studying. And the Galois correspondence theorem is nothing more than a flipping of this card. It tells us that the picture that we get on one side and the picture that we get on the other side are going to have exactly the same shape every time. On this side we have a picture of a field extension and its intermediate fields. On the other side we have a picture of the automorphism group of that field extension and all of its subgroups. Not only are the pictures necessarily the same, according to the Galois correspondence theorem, but we'll also see that the properties of these extensions, in other words, the relationships between the smaller field and the big field, and between the smaller group and the big group, those relationships will also be the same in a lot of ways. So this is a very, very powerful theorem. It really does tell us that whatever story is being told by this lattice of subgroups, that very same story gets told by the lattice of intermediate fields, and vice versa. Anything that we can see happening in an intermediate field, we can see happening in a subgroup of the automorphism group instead. So the Galois correspondence begins with the following theorem. The first part of the theorem is that correspondence between subgroups and subfields. So it relates a subfield of E, which is the extended field here, to a subgroup of the Galois group of E over F. In other words, the automorphisms of the extended field over the base. So on the left-hand side, we have a picture of some fields. And here we're going to use the splitting field of t cubed minus 2. Uh, so it's q extended by 2 to the 1 third, as well as the third root of unity. On the right-hand side, we're going to talk about its automorphism group. And we know, based on previous videos, that its automorphism group is isomorphic to S3, the full symmetric group on three symbols. Now, because this is a normal extension, we had the normal extension theorem that told us that the fixed field of the entire automorphism group must be the base field. In other words, the only elements which remain in place under the action of the entire automorphism group are elements of the base field Q. And so to Q, to that base field, we're going to associate the full automorphism group, which we said is isomorphic to the symmetric group on three symbols. What about the field on top? Well, the field Q adjoined 2 to the 1 3rd and zeta 3, what are the elements of the automorphism group that fix the whole thing? Only the identity automorphism will fix the entire extended field. So we're going to associate the trivial subgroup to that entire extended field. So you can already see where the order reversal is going to be coming in, that we have the bigger field on top on the left, while we have the biggest group on the bottom on the right. Now let's look at the in-betweens. The subgroup of S3 that consists of the elements of order 3, so the rotations if we're thinking of it as a dihedral group, or the three cycles if we're thinking of it as a symmetric group, that's an index 2 subgroup of S3. And its action as automorphisms on the field on the left is that it permutes the various cubed roots of 2 in this splitting field. So 2 to the 1 3rd gets permuted with its conjugates, 2 to the 1 3rd zeta 3 and 2 to the 1 3rd zeta 3 squared. So the question is, what field does that correspond to, which is intermediate between Q and the splitting field? To answer that question, we just want to know what elements are fixed under this group of permutations. Well, because we're rotating around the 2 to the 1 thirds, we're leaving the zeta 3s, the cube roots of unity, in place. And so any element which is built only out of those cube roots of unity is going to stay put under this entire subgroup of automorphisms. Therefore, the fixed field that we associate with this subgroup is Q adjoined zeta 3. And so on the left, we have that intermediate field sitting in between the base and the extension. Not only that, the fact that this uh, subgroup on the right is an index 2 subgroup of S3 will also guarantee for us that this field extension from Q up to the fixed field of that subgroup is a degree 2 extension. So the index of a subgroup and the degree of its fixed field are exactly the same thing. That's also why we use the same notation for the degree of a finite extension that we do for the index of a subgroup. All right, what else do we have? S3, or D3, the dihedral group of the triangle, also has these two element subgroups. These are the reflective subgroups if we're thinking of them as symmetries of a triangle. And there are three of them because a the triangle has three axes of symmetry. On the other hand, we could say that there's three of them because there are three independent uh, transpositions in the symmetric group that we could be using. 
And each one of those corresponds to an automorphism of our extended field as well. If we're thinking of t as the element which trades out the third root of unity for its square, which is the same as its conjugate, then the fixed field of that subgroup is the field q adjoined 2 to the 1 3rd. We can check with a little bit of algebra that the fixed field of e and tr, so that includes not only swapping zeta 3 for its conjugate, but also swapping 2 to the 1 3rd for one of its conjugates, that the fixed field of that is q adjoined 2 to the 1 3rd times 1 plus zeta 3. And likewise with e and tr squared, that fixes 2 to the 2 thirds times 1 plus zeta 3. Each of those two element subgroups of S3 is an index 3 subgroup of S3. And the extensions, the field extensions that we get on the left, are degree 3 extensions. So here we have a picture in which all of our intermediate fields on the left correspond in a one-to-one -one fashion with subgroups of the automorphism group on the right. And the correspondence is order reversing again because on the left-hand side, our fields are arranged from smallest on the bottom to biggest on the top. But in order to fix a larger field, we end up having fewer elements, smaller subgroups of our Galois group that can do that. And so the bigger groups on the right are in the bottom. So larger fields correspond to smaller groups because in order to fix more elements, we have to have fewer automorphisms that do that. So we're putting more restrictions on the automorphisms that fix a larger group than a smaller group. So this is the real main point of the Galois correspondence theorem. But there's two more pieces that are really going to help us down the line to understand more about the structure of splitting fields of polynomials. Not only is there a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two pictures of fields and groups, there is also a correspondence between normal subgroups and normal extensions that I believe explains why we use the word normal to describe a normal field extension. So here are these two pictures yet again. On the left, we have the subfield lattice of q adjoined 2 to the 1 3rd and zeta 3, the splitting field of t cubed minus 2. On the right, we have the subgroup lattice of S3, which is the Galois group of that polynomial and that splitting field. Now, if we take a look at what happens when we conjugate one of the subgroups on the right by an element, so take E and T, for example, that two element subgroup, if we conjugate it by R, by an element from outside of that subgroup, what do we get? Well, we find out just by computation in S3 that that conjugate actually gives us E and TR. So it doesn't give us the same subgroup. Therefore, the subgroup E and T is not a normal subgroup of S3, because if it were, when we conjugated it by any element, we have to get the same subgroup again. But we got something different. So those two subgroups on the right are conjugate subgroups. They're conjugate by the element R. Remember, R is the automorphism of our splitting field, which sends 2 to the 1 3rd to 2 to the 1 3rd times zeta 3. So it flips one of the, the roots of that degree 3 extension around. But the second part of the Galois correspondence will tell us that if R conjugates one of our subgroups into another, then that automorphism R is also going to send one of our subfields to the other. And R applied to 2 to the 1 3rd gives us 2 to the 1 3rd zeta 3. And so on the left hand side, it sends that subfield, Q adjoined 2 to the 1 3rd, to the other subfield to which it is conjugate, q adjoined 2 to the 1 3rd times 1 plus zeta. So conjugation on the right picture corresponds to the application of an automorphism in the left picture. So conjugate subgroups correspond to image subfields, which we're going to call conjugate subfields. And as a special case, if I have a subgroup on the right which is normal, then any conjugation is going to leave that subgroup in place. In other words, for any element g, g times that subgroup times g inverse is going to give us the same subgroup back. So the only thing to which it is conjugate is itself. And so if a subgroup on the right is conjugate to itself, that means that its corresponding subfield on the left will be its own image. In other words, when we apply the automorphism g, whatever g is, we're going to get the same subfield back. Therefore, g is going to be an automorphism of that intermediate field. So it's an element of the Galois group, of, in this case, q adjoins zeta 3 over q. Therefore, it fixes only q, which implies, by our normal extension theorem, that this extension, q adjoins zeta 3 over q, is a normal extension. And that is awesome, because it means that any subgroup on the right, which is a normal subgroup, will correspond to a field extension on the left, which is a normal extension. So normal subgroups correspond to normal extensions, precisely because conjugate subgroups correspond to conjugate subfields. 
and the normals are the ones that are conjugate only to themselves. And when we have normal subgroups, we can compute quotient groups. We can take the quotient and the set of cosets of that quotient is going to form a group. So what does quotient tell us about subfields? This is the last, but certainly not least, portion of the Galois correspondence that I call quotients flow downhill. So taking a look at our example on the right, where we have this Z mod 3 subgroup of S3, which is a normal subgroup. What is the quotient of S3 by that subgroup? Well, it's a two element group, EH and TH, where T is the non-trivial uh, transposition uh, in S3. So the question is, does that quotient group that we found on the right-hand side appear as an automorphism group of the fields on the left-hand side. Remembering here that T is the automorphism that sends zeta 3 to zeta 3 squared, we can readily see that on the picture on the left, that's an element of the Galois group of Q adjoins zeta 3 over Q. In other words, this quotient group that we got on the right is exactly the automorphism group of the corresponding extension that we see on the left. And that's this last portion of the Galois correspondence. So in other words, the Galois groups that we see of the extensions on the left-hand side are isomorphic to the quotient groups that we would see for the extensions on the right-hand side, which also implies that we can only really do this exactly if we have self-conjugacy. In other words, if we have normal subgroups on the right. So if I have normal subgroups, then the quotients of those normal subgroups are going to tell us what the automorphism groups of the corresponding extensions on the left are. So the only other ones that we can decorate here are the only other normal subgroups that we have, which is the trivial subgroup as a subgroup of those three two-element subgroups on the right. Um, and therefore, those Z mod 2s that we get as quotients on the right are isomorphic to the automorphism groups that we get, which consist of E and T, on the left. But those extensions on the right, sorry, those subgroups on the right, which were not normal subgroups, we don't get enough automorphisms on the left to be isomorphic to the quotient. And after all, the quotient on the right, if the subgroup is not normal, is not even a group. So that's not even an issue. But this really puts the cherry on top of the sundae for the Galois correspondence. That not only do subfields and subgroups correspond exactly in a one-to-one -one fashion, one-to-one -one in order reversing fashion, it's also true that conjugacy and therefore normality corresponds in subgroups and in subfields. And moreover, that quotients of uh, automorphism groups will tell us the automorphism groups of the smaller extensions on the left. We're going to use the Galois correspondence at a critical moment in understanding why our story of solvability of polynomials changes when we move from degrees 2, 3, and 4 into degree 5. So look for this to come back in our next series of videos.